This is our last 2 2 example. We're going back to 2 2 for a minute. Limit x approaches 0. This is a slightly different problem than the one you asked me, but this should give you enough insight. All right, so how in the world do we do this? So wouldn't it be nice if it was sine 5x over sine 5x? Why would that be really nice? If, so if this 3 was a 5, why would that be a really easy limit? It'd be 1. Yeah, it'd be 0 over 0. But remember, x is close to 0, but not equal to 0. So you can just say, ah, it's always 1 approaching 0, so it's going to be 1. Uh, this is not what we have, though. Unfortunately, we don't have 5x on the bottom, so we need to do a little work. So it's probably not obvious, but what you need to use, so this is something I wrote down a while ago, lim x approaches 0, sine x over x is 1. So that was the limit I wrote down before. Also, the reciprocal, if you flip it over, you're also going to get 1. So if your original limit's 1, if you take the reciprocal, you'll get the reciprocal of 1, which is also 1. So I'll write that one down also. So lim x approaches 0. All right, so these are two things that we know. So unfortunately, they're not... The situation we're starting with is not this. So what is different about the situation we're starting with? So there's sine of both sides. There's also no just x by itself. That's the other problem. So there's two problems going on here. So there's no sine by itself, and there's no x. So I just multiply by x over x. That's legal because x over x is not, uh, x over x is always 1, except for if x is 0. But again, we're taking a limit, so x is close to 0, but not 0. So x over x is going to be 1, as opposed to undefined. Now what we're going to do is reorder things. So what we're really looking at, a, b over c, d, you can write that as a over c, times b over d. Multiplying fractions is very easy. Adding fractions is a different story. Multi multiplying fractions is super easy. So I'm just going to regroup a little bit. So if I regroup like this, that's not really very useful. So I'm basically going to have what I started with times 1. So that's not how I want to regroup. I want to order, order things differently. So we're going to regroup in a better way. So what I'm going to do is pair up x with sine 3x and sine 5x over x, like this. Uh, almost. So why can I not just use the uh, property I wrote down over here? Uh, because there's five and three there. A stupid three is there. Ah, what if I just go 3x and 5x? That would fix the one problem. Or I'd have, this is basically the left limit here is this one's going to be one, and the right one's going to be one. But why is that illegal to just multiply a three and a five? It's going to change it. So how do I fix that so I'm not doing some naughty algebra? What do I multiply by? Five over three. That's right, 5 over 3 to compensate for what I just wrote in there. So we got 5 thirds right there. So I multiplied and divided by 3, multiplied and divided by 5. So I'm not changing anything overall. Now, when we look over here, I see 3x and sine 3x, not exactly x and sine x, but 
it'll also work if you put the same number in front of x in both places. So if you treat them the same, it'll still work. And same thing if I go sine of a times x divided by a times x. So I can put a number, as long as it's the same number, it'll be OK. So in this case, either a is 3 or 5, depending on if we're looking at either one. So getting back to this, so I could use our limit rule Uh, we get the constant multiple 5 thirds, we can bring that out front. So we get that limit times lim x approaches 0 of the other one. And then good news is those two limits are both 1. So you got 1 times 1 times 5 thirds. So we just have 5 thirds as our times 1 times 1 is 5 thirds. Now the problem that you showed me is a little bit different, but I think this will help you get to where you need to go. Uh, that WebWare problem had an extra x hanging out somewhere, and that x, so for example, if there was an extra, if we started with an extra x on the top, right here, I'll do this in blue, so I'll just put this extra x in in blue. So if I had an extra x right here, you just carry that through, you get another x, another x, you get another limb x approaches 0 of x, which this limit will be 0 right here. So same thing you had before, you just get an extra time 0, which will be 5 thirds times 0, which is 0. So that's how your problem will differ, could differ from this problem right here. Wouldn't that always be the case if you got an extra, eight, uh, an extra x? Yeah, it wouldn't matter the 5 and the 3 at that point. It could have been 5 trillion and, you know. So Negative 300. What's that? So there would always be zero if there was an extra x. Yeah. So on web work, you would just say zero, uh, but you want to sure know how you, why is it zero? So I'm going to take those uh, blue x's back out and all that blue stuff back out. So we're back into left and, no, we're back in continuous. That's where we are. Hmm? Yes. So we're back into continuity. Yes, we're recording. So it was pointed out yesterday that it would take infinitely long to prove a function was actually continuous on interval, because there's infinite numbers inside the interval. It's actually worse than that. There's uncountably infinite numbers inside the interval. So it's a second order of infinity, which we don't need to worry about. Uh, if you really want to know more about that, just Wikipedia infinity and keep reading. And somewhere things will get really tricky. And they'll talk about uh, LF naught and the different levels, the different magnitudes of infinity. Uh, we don't need to worry about that, not even in any of the calculus classes. That's a real analysis. You get into that with real analysis if you major in mathematics. So if you like thinking of infinity, uh, you may want to major in math. All right, let's go for let's do some easy functions here. So C is a constant. So where C is a constant. So where is f of x equals C continuous? All right, it's easy to graph this function. There you go, horizontal line. Very easy to graph. What is limit? 
as x approaches anything of c. C is a constant. C. Does that depend on what a was for this particular function? That's for all a. All a in the real numbers. What is f of a for any a in the real numbers? C. So we can say the limit, and we just did two-sided limit. The limit matches the function value for all real numbers. So what can I say about continuity? It is continuous for all real numbers. So I write that down. Uh, f of x equals c is continuous for all. And I'll write the real numbers as the open interval, negative infinity to positive infinity. So a nice way to summarize this, constant functions are continuous. So I'm just going to write that sentence down. Constant functions are continuous. And I'll specify on their domain. which is usually all real numbers, unless you're dealing with a special constant function. So we could use that, what we just got right there. I can't say that this function, this function is not constant, but if you look at small intervals, it's constant. For example, 0 to 1, open interval 0 to 1, constant. So it's going to be continuous from 0 to 1. Open interval zero to, uh, 1 to 2, constant, continuous over there. So I can just use this theorem, or what we just wrote down, to say this function is continuous on each of these small open intervals. So now that's the easiest function you can write down. So we'll do another, the next easiest function to write down is the identity, where is f of x equals x continuous? So what you need to do, I can graph it. It's very easy to graph. So I want to know what is the limit as x approaches a of x, and what is f of a? So find the limit and then f of a. This might be too easy that it actually feels difficult. You probably don't even need to rub two brain cells together. One will probably do it. Nope. You can look back at your limit rules two, two. So what do I get if I take A and I F it? What does F do to A? Not very much, just gives you A, right? Just whatever my input is, that's my output. So f of a is a. Whatever x value input, that's your output also. That number's your output. What about limit? What is the limit as x approaches a of x? That's a. That's straight off our limit laws, limit rules that we wrote down. And does this depend on which a that I picked, or is this any a? It's any a in the real numbers. So what can I conclude? Limit's always a, when x approaches a, and that equals f of a. So it's continuous on all real numbers. So I can say this function continuous on all real numbers. On the exam, do you want us to like write things like that, is continuous on all real numbers, rather than just like is continuous? Uh, you'll need to specify where. So you could say all real numbers. If it's not all real numbers, you can tell me that the intervals is continuous on. Okay. Or I'm more, more likely to ask you where is this function not continuous and why? I think that's what the, uh, wasn't your practice exam? So you saw the announcement yesterday, hopefully, for the practice uh, exam problems. So what I'm going to do is add up a discussion section 
for answering the practice exam problems. And we'll just use the same discussion section. Uh, use that practice exam the whole quarter. So midterm two problems are on there and final exam problems are on there. So I'll just open up one discussion section that is exam review questions uh, and answers. And then you can post up your, you know, is this right? You can put up your work and other people can say yes it is, <coughs> good job, or no it's not, here's why. And I think you know it's not nice to say no it's not. Uh, you're stupid. Well, then you are stupid if you don't put an apostrophe, but uh, they also know who you are on Canvas. It's not anonymous, like the internet. The internet's not really anonymous, but. All right, we're all nice here, so nobody's going to be a jerk. Uh, the idea, geez, identity. D E N T I T Y, the identity function is continuous on negative infinity to positive infinity. So that's pretty much enough to get us started. What we're going to do after this is show that the sum of continuous functions is continuous. The difference, is continu difference of two continuous functions is also continuous. Products, quotients, powers are also continuous. And then we're basically going to graph the trig functions and say they're continuous also from the graphs. So these are properties of continuous functions. So we'll suppose fx and g of x are continuous at x equals a. Then the following starts then on the next line. So suppose f and g are continuous at x equals a. Then the following are continuous at x equals a. So first one, f of x plus g of x. Next one, f of x minus g of x. Uh, f of x times g of x. And uh, a number, c, times f of x, so constant times f of x, which technically you don't need because constant functions are continuous, so I could just say, well, this function f could just be constant, so constant times another is, uh, continuous function is continuous. But we'll write that one up there. I have to be a little careful if I say fx over gx is continuous. What could be the problem? gx could be a continuous function, but yet fx over gx may fail to be continuous. How could that happen? G of x is equal to zero. Yep, so if that's specific. So when, so I can write when g of a is not zero. So when I use that x value, it better not be divided by zero or else I don't have a continuous function. So a super easy example, uh, 1 over x is probably the easiest one I could think of. Not continuous is 0. Even though constant function 1 is continuous, and in the denominator, the identity function is continuous. So this is not continuous at x equals 0. So that's a really probably the easiest example I could think of off the top of my head that you've got two continuous functions, constant and identity, but once you divide them, you're not going to be continuous when the denominator is zero. And last up, f of x to the n power. You have to be a little 
real careful with powers. What happens if n was, for example, 1 half? There'd be a square root. So what could go wrong if uh, I had a nice continuous function and I took a square root? Yeah, so if it's negative, it would be imaginary. So I'm going to write f of x to the n when f a to the n is defined. I should say that. Oh, so you is real. Oh, that's a really good question. Let's answer that. I was going to prove one of these first, but let's go ahead and uh, talk about that x to the. So we'll talk about x to the zero. So yeah. So zero. Yeah, x to the zero. If, if n was zero, and then if x hit zero as well, it would be one. All right. So if it was continuous, so the question is: Is, is this zero to the zero? Well, 0, 0 is not defined, so let's look a little more closely. So it's not a re it's basically, it's not a real number is the problem. So it's not, it's not continuous by this theorem, or it's not provably continuous by this theorem. So let's look a little closer. What is x to the 0 power equal to when x is not 0? It's always 1, right? And negative numbers to the 0 power are also 1. Well, that's enough to say what the limit is right there. Does the limit care when x equals 0? Sure doesn't. So this equals 1. So limit's 1, but 0 to the 0 is not 1. 0 to the 0 is undefined. So undefined is not equal to 1. So x to the 0 not continuous at x equals 0. So does that partially answer your question? I don't want to talk too much more about 0 to the 0 until calc 2. You're going to have to wait. There's L'Hopital's rule. You're not allowed to use L'Hopital's rule for your midterm. If you use it on some of your homeworks, that's OK but I don't want you using it on your midterm. I actually don't want you using it on your homeworks because I want to see algebra for your 0 over 0 limits. Don't use L'Hopital's rule. Because you're going to, in order to use L'Hopital's rule, you have to use derivative, and we haven't learned derivative yet. So you're not allowed to use derivatives. All right, so that one's out of the way. So we're going to just prove one of these right here, and we'll do the We'll just do the sum rule. How about that? So we're going to suppose So we're supposing f and g are continuous at x equals a. What we want to show is f plus g is continuous at a. So we're supposing that and we want to show So here's where you need to know definitions. So this is what we're trying to show. So I'll put it inside of this cloud, because that's our goal, is to get there. You can sort of think of proofs like identities, where you're starting on one side and getting to the other side. The only difference is uh, we're going to need to use quite a bit more than just algebra. So it's sort of like a trig identity. You start one side, get to the other side. Um, the other difference is you're going one direction. You're not going back the other way necessarily. So uh, a true identity is they're equal uh, is an if and only if. So if you know one, you know the other, and vice versa. All right, what does it mean to be continuous? So what does this actually mean right here? Who can tell me what it means for f of x to be continuous at x equals a? So I think that's right. What is that? So the negative and positive limit of uh, x approaching a is the same as f of a is equal to the limit of both limits. 
Yep, so the value matches, you could write it, the value matches the left and the right limit, or we can write it even more succinctly, the value matches just the limit. So that's what it means to be continuous. That's the definition. If you flip back in your notes, that should be the definition. That better be a definition. And I'm, I'm not worried about left and right continuous. We're just going to go continuous. So we're assuming it's an interior point. So we're using this definition right here. That's the definition we're going with. So I, I didn't write left and right continuous, so we're just assuming it's full continuous. And separately, g of x is continuous at x equals a means lim x approaches a, g of x equals g of a. So exact same thing, you just got g instead of f. All right, so we know what we're starting with, the properties we're starting with. So let's translate what we're uh, trying to get to. So what does it mean for f plus g to be continuous at x equals a? You can say it in three words, limit matches value. So limit of f plus g better equal the value of f plus g. So I'll write that down. Now this is what we're trying to show. A very common thing to do, a very common logical error is assume your conclusion. So what we don't know is are they equal? So I need to show that they're actually equal. So we can start on either side. Doesn't matter which one you start on. I'm going to, let's start on the left side. No, the right side. All right, f of a plus g of a. How can I rewrite this? There's not much else we wrote down in this problem, or in this proof. How about f of a equals a limit of f of as x approaches a? So that's all I'm gonna do, is substitute out f of a. So I'm using this right here, and I'm going to replace f of a with what's equal to f of a. So not much going on right there. And what can I do with g of a? Same thing. So g of a is a limit of g as x approaches a. So exact same thing with a g. We're almost there. So that's what I want to conclude. Why is that actually equal to the previous step? Why am I allowed to take two limits and put them into a single limit like that? Because it's continuous. That's what we're trying to show. It would be continuous if this is in fact equal. But why am I allowed to take two limits, add them together, and say it's one limit? That's a sum property back with the limit laws. So we look at the limit laws, as long as your limits exist, which we assume are continuous, so they definitely exist. So we can say our uh, limits, so this uses the sum rule or the sum law for the limits. And if we really quickly go back to that, Limit of function, limit laws, should be, oh, there's a ton of stuff here. 
Somewhere up here, we did some limit laws. There we go. So we're using the sum right there at the top. Limit of f plus g is limit of f plus limit of g. So we can just take two limits, add together, put into a single limit as long as they exist. If they don't exist, that's a different story, but we assume that they exist because they were continuous. Would we ever be asked to prove a quotient one? Because it can't be continuous if that's zero, right? So uh, no, I generally won't ask you to prove things, to prove theorems. So in general, we won't be asked to prove theorems. You will have to sit, state why a function is continuous, and you can just use words to say why. And we'll have some nice theorems at the end that you won't have to say, oh, because it's the sum of powers of uh, you know, constant multiples. You can just say, it's a polynomial, therefore it's continuous on all real numbers. You don't have to say, oh, I'm using you know, this continuous rule and this other continuous rule and this other continuous rule. We'll, we'll wrap them up into a nice um, set at the end of more powerful rules. All right, there we go. That's it. Limit equals value. We're continuous at x equals a. So when you finish your proof, you can draw a box, rectangle, fill it in. I think in your book, these are like light blue or something, which is why your book costs so much money, all that color in there. But you buy an affordable math book, and it will just be a black box. All right, so that is the sum rule. Now I can basically do that for every single one here. I just go and get the corresponding limit law. There's a difference law, a product law, a quotient law, a power law. So I'm not going to go through and prove the rest. It's exactly the same. You just use the corresponding limit law. So definitely have those memorized. Yeah. I mean, they'll basically be algebraic combinations of continuous functions are continuous as long as you're not divided by zero, pretty much. Uh, that's basically the, what you should come away with here. All right, so now we're going to prove polynomials are continuous. Well, let's write. Let's write this properly. Theorem, polynomials are continuous, and then proof. Now, I wrote on their domain, what is the domain of a polynomial? All real numbers, so infinity, negative, negative infinity, positive infinity. So polynomials are continuous on their domain. All right, proof. What does any polynomial look like? I'll call it P of x. What's the standard way we write polynomials? That's an example of a second degree polynomial. There we go. So constant times x to a power plus, so this will be the highest degree term, and then we write the next highest, next highest, next highest, down to a degree. That's the minus 1 in minus 1 thing, right? Yep. Okay. So we write dot, 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 plus a1x to the 1 plus a0 right there. So there's a polynomial written out. Whatever degree your polynomial is, that's n right there. And if you're, it's totally okay. You, in general, you don't want a n to be zero, or else you just start at a lower power of uh, x. You don't want the leading coefficient to be zero. For example, zero x to the fifth plus x squared plus three. You don't really write the zero x to the fifth. You would just say it's a degree two polynomial. So that's why you assume an is not zero. That won't affect us here, though. 
All right, so there's polynomial. Any polynomial can be written in this form. <coughs> I'll use the letter A. So let's not have x approaches A. Let's do a uh, pick x approach a C instead, because I don't want to, you have too many A's written on here. So we'll take any value C from negative infinity to positive infinity. So what is P of C? That's pretty easy to write. Actually, let's start with the limit instead. That'll be, I think that'll be a nicer place to start. Oh, what do, let's write what we're trying to show. So we want to show. It's actually very easy to write down what we want to show. Maybe not easy, but it will fit in a very small area. What do we want to show? We want to show it's p of x is continuous. So what does that mean at any c value? So we want to show p x continuous at x equals c for any for any uh, c value. All right. So we need the definition. So that's definition right there. Not much going on for continuous. Limit equals value. So we can start on either side. I'm going to start on the limit side. Now if we flip back again to our limit laws. Somewhere, we did polynomials. Oh, look at that. One or two weeks ago, we all agreed that limit x approaches c, p of x equals p of c. There's really no work to do. It's already right there. We showed it a week ago using all limit laws very carefully. So that's what it means right there to be continuous. So there's really no work to do here. There wasn't much work to do on the last problem, or the last proof. So this uses, uses limit laws, or use using using limit laws. That's all there is to do right there. We're done. Didn't matter what C was because you're in a polynomial. And that black box or blue box or whatever means it's continuous? That black box means I'm done with the I'm done demonstrating or proving that this is true. So what I can say now is polynomials are continuous on their domain. I mean, I could say that before, but now I can say definitively it's true. We prove that it's true. All right, next theorem. Rational functions are continuous on their domain. Why is that? I probably should have pointed it out when we we're on the other page, but there is the rational function limit is the value, as long as you're not divided by zero. So as long as you're in the domain. So it took me a minute to flip back, so I'm not going to flip back, but you can see right next to it, polynomials have the same property rational functions do with their limits. You just have to be careful, as long as you're not divided by zero, it'll work out. All right, so I'm not going to go and prove that, it's the exact same proof. I'm going to underline domain twice because the domain is not all real numbers. Most rational functions have vertical asymptotes. So there's a few that don't, but most rational functions are going to have vertical asymptotes. All right, theorem 9. I'll just write theorem number 9 in your book. Composition of continuous functions are continuous.
So before we prove this, I'm going to give you probably the most useful uh, property of continuous functions. And you basically already knew this. So I'm going to write this down. So when fx is continuous at x equals a, obviously we get lim x approaches a f of x equals f of a. So that's just definition of what it means to be continuous. Now I'm going to do something that's a little bit silly. What is limit x approaches a of x? That's a. That's easy. So now what I'm going to do is replace this a that I just made bold, I'm going to replace that a by lim x approaches a of x. So they're equal, so I'm just going to take that out, put the limit in its place. So we'll cut out the middleman, or the middle expression. This is very, very useful. Very useful, or very, very useful, I should say. Not just very useful. All right, now we're going to use this to prove composition of continuous functions are continuous. Don't write like this in your English paper, please. Is that what you call passing a limit through a function? Yes, yeah, so I call this passing a limit through, the fun through a continuous function, not through any function, but through a continuous function. So that is super useful right there. So we're going to prove composition of continuous to continuous. And unfortunately, I have to leave you at the good part. <laughs>